We're continuing a series that we started last week. And we're following along with some of the things the Lord has been talking to us about since our time of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And one of the things the Lord let us know during that time is that we're walking into a season. We're already in it. And we're walking further into a season of rest, a season of refreshing, a season of renewal. That one of the things the Lord promised us here was victory, unprecedented victory. But we know when he told us victory, that means there was a fight. You, don't, you can't have victory if you, can't, if you don't fight. We know victory is a gift because the Bible says, thanks be to God who always gives us the victory. But God gives us the victory on the battlefields of life. So we're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. We're going to have to show up and do what he's called us to do. And one of the things a couple months ago through the utterance gifts, the Lord told us to engage every giant. He says it was going to prepare us for what he had for us next year. And then later on, he let us know it's because he's taking us to rest. Because victory is good, but rest is better. Come on, that victory is good, but talking about the victory over fried chicken after the battle is done is much better than the victory itself. Rest is better than victory. And the rest God has for us is not a cease from activity, but it's going to be increase of productivity done the right way, aided by the wind of the Spirit of God. This is the season we're walking into. And so let's go to Romans chapter 15, verse 4 and 5, a scripture we looked at last week. And I encourage you, if you missed that message, we put it up on YouTube and our podcast, as well as on our Faith Plus app, so you can listen to it. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. We'll start with verse 4. It says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Say hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Now we defined last week that the word patience means perseverance and cheerful endurance. The word consolation we see here, also the same word for comfort, is the same Greek word which means solace, which is comfort or consolations in time of distress or sadness. Solace is comfort or consolations in a time of distress or sadness. It's also that which affords consolation or refreshment. So we said through the scriptures, we receive perseverance and comforting refreshment that produces hope within us. We looked at 2 Timothy 3.16, which informed us that the scriptures are God-breathed or inspired by God. And so there is a refreshing God gives us by being in the word of God. Specifically, what Paul is talking about here in this scripture is looking at the Old Testament, looking at the stories of God's faithfulness to his people in the Old Testament, causes us to be refreshed. It causes us to strengthen our cheerful endurance, knowing that if God brought them through, he can bring us through. If God brought Moses through, he can bring us through. If God brought Joseph through, he can bring us through. If God brought Esther through, he can bring us through. That's what the Old Testament reminds us of. And we know the scripture tells us in Hebrews that the Old Testament, they have an old and inferior covenant. But the covenant we have because of Christ Jesus is better. Now, why is a $20 better than a $10 bill? Well, the 20 has a 10 in it. So the covenant you have has all the good things of the old plus all the wonderful things of the new. So if you can have comfort and endurance and hope because of what God did back then, just imagine what God can do now. So one of the things we harped on last week is we are people of hope. We are not to be the hopeless. We are to be the hopeful. We looked at this last week from Ezekiel that you may feel like dry bones. You may feel like you've been through too much. You may feel like your hope is lost. But the winds of the Spirit are blowing into your life right now, bringing refreshing. See, God knows what you've been through. He's not some far off God who doesn't know what you've dealt with this week, last month, this past year, the past couple years, during this time of that's been unprecedented in our lives. It's like what he told Hagar. He said, I am the God that sees you. That's why he has refreshing for you. That's why the Holy Spirit is moving in such a way to bring refreshing to your life and to your family. We are not the hopeful. We are the hopeful, not the hopeless. 
we have a great reason to be people of hope because we said because we belong to Jesus. We look through scriptures that remind us that because we're united to Christ Jesus, we are not without hope. This is before we were saved, we were a people far from God and without hope. But because we're not far from God, we're with God now, we're united to Christ Jesus, we are people of hope. And scriptures also tell us we are born again to a living hope. We also looked at those scriptures as God wants us to overflow with hope. How we are to be prisoners of hope that Jesus is the foundation of our hope. Our hope is based in him. Your hope will be shaky if it's based on this world and the circumstances of this world. Come on, if your hope is based in crypto, you'll be kind of shaky right now. If your hope is based on what variant is out there, you'd be really shaky right now. We have the Greek fraternity of viruses out there. If your hope is based on the Greek fraternity of variants and viruses, you will be shaky in your everyday life. But if your hope is based on Jesus, no matter what comes on this planet, you can be hopeful. No matter what you face, no matter what pressure, no matter what tribulation, no matter what trial, no matter what attack, no matter what news report, no matter what goes on in this world, if your hope is based on Jesus, you can be hopeful. And God has called us to be people of hope. You know, we focus on this a lot, you know, hence our name, Faith Christian Center. We're to be faith people. But we can't be effective faith people if we're not people of hope. I said it before, hope is the blueprint, faith is the materials. Because then all you do is have faith, and you have a bunch of materials, and you don't know what you're building. You just got a bunch of materials. We have to be people of faith, and people of hope. And we define hope as positive expectation. Positive expectation. It is our job to be people of positive expectation and not be those of negative hope. What's negative hope? We call that despair. Expecting something evil. Expecting something bad. Well, pastor, bad things come in threes. I got hit with two things this morning, so I'm just looking out for the third one. That means you're a person of despair. It's primarily our job to make sure we're people of hope, not despair. It is a daily job. You're going to have to look at your life every single day. And if you find social media is robbing you of your hope, turn it off. If you find that the news media is robbing you of your hope, turn it off. You don't need to stare at it all day. Because if it's causing you to be something God told you not to be, then you need to look at what's causing you to depart from what God has called you to be and figure out what you need to do to maintain your own life. It's called setting boundaries. Too many of us want God to do everything, but God has given us wisdom to set boundaries. It's like dating people. I tell you to set boundaries. You don't need to talk to them at all hours of the night. Well, they just want to come over at 3 a.m. Yeah, right. Netflix and chill, right. Set boundaries. In the same way, to stay a person of hope and a person of faith, you must set boundaries. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 11, verse 29. Enough review. Let me jump into where we're going today. And so earlier this week, I was on a run, and the Lord was talking to me and sharing some things with me. And he said, I'll paraphrase what he said. He said, at this time of year, many people's minds are on gifts. And he said after that, and that's fine. But what would what would shock most people is that my mind is also on gifts. And then he went on and said, but it's not those gifts you buy in the store. It's the giftings I put in people that they've allowed to grow dormant. Giftings I put on the inside of them that they've allowed to die. Giftings I put on the inside of them that they thought was over with, it was done for, that it was, there's no way God can ever use that again. Those giftings are on God's mind right now. Go to Romans chapter 11, verse 29. 
See, a lot of us, some of us are still shopping. Some of you, you know, you planners, you got shopped three months ago. You already got your stuff hidden away and wrapped maybe already. Y'all advanced. Some of you who will be shopping up to Christmas Eve. God bless you. But God has his mind on gifts. Not gifts for you to receive in the future. Gifts he's put on the inside of you already. Not saying you need another gifting, another anointing. I'm talking about what you already have that you have allowed to grow dormant, that you've allowed to die because you've lost hope. You've become a person of despair or you've taken too many hits from life. Or somebody when you're younger says, you know, you got to let that go. There's no way that can be effective in your life. You, there's nothing you can do about that. Or somebody crushed your dream when you're younger. So be more realistic. And he let gifts in you go dormant and die. But God has not forgotten about the gift. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. What does the scripture say here? For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Paul is talking specifically about the nation of Israel and God's plan for that nation. But although at that time they weren't doing what they're supposed to do, he says God's plan for them is still working. And we look here, it's a blanket statement. So if the gifts and callings are without repentance for Israel, it's the same for you. The New King James says it this way, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The New Living Translation is for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Another translation, he's not going to take it back. He doesn't take back his gift because you messed up. He did not take back his gifting because you screwed up. He did not take back his gift because you left him for 30 years. He didn't take back his gifting because you blew up your life so bad that nobody else wants to be around you. You call them and they don't answer. They got your name saved as do not answer. And you think everybody is done with me, so God must be done with me. That's not true. Well, maybe God's not done with me. He's forgiven me, but there's no way that that gift he gave me all of those years ago when I was walking with God is still working. The scripture says the gifts and calling of God without repentance, they were irrevocable. They will not be withdrawn. They will not be taken back. That gift is still there. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 with me. The gift is still there, and so is the call. Another word for call is invitation. God did not withdraw his invitation. The holy invitation is still there. It's still waiting for you to answer. See, some of you have been invited to weddings. Says, well, you have to RSVP by this date. Some of you have passed the date that God wants you to RSVP. And you're thinking, well, the event has ended. And God says, no. The invite is still there. See, a lot of times we think we're waiting on God, but God is waiting on us. You might say, no, there's been too many years past. See, one of the things I learned about the mercy of God is like a GPS. That you might have screwed up for years and years and decades upon decades upon decades upon decades. But you finally got it right. And when you make that turn, all of a sudden, it seems like all those lost years are evaporated. And you're suddenly standing exactly where God wants you to be. Now, you went through some stuff you never were supposed to go through. It's your fault. God didn't want you to experience that. That's not what God sent to teach you. You sent that to teach yourself. But now that you've turned, God even talks about in the book of Joel, the people he was prophesying to lost out on things because of their rebellion, because of their disobedience. They lost out. But God says, because you turned, I'll give it all back to you plus some. 
It was their fault they missed out. It was their fault they lost it all. But because of the goodness of our God, God says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. What is the major part of that? The turn. Turn. Don't delay. Turn. Don't say, well, I don't know if I'm going to respond. No, respond now and turn. The gift is still relevant. The invite is still open. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. I, I encourage you guys to pray this prayer every day. I pray it every day, and I pray it every day for you. Pray it every day for yourselves and for your family and those you know. Paul says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. This is what he prays. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding are being enlightened. Another translation says, flooded with light, that you may know what happens when your eyes are open. What happens when the eyes are flooded with light? What happens when you operate in the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him? That you may know what is the hope of his calling. It lists some other things too, but the hope of his calling. The expectation of his invitation. Because some of you don't know what he has for you because your eyes have been closed. Or you've closed your own eyes. And some of you have purposely closed your eyes because of what you've done, because of your past, because of what you've experienced, because of all the sin and the iniquity behind the curtain that you've closed to put on your holy face today. Come on, we've been wearing masks in church way before 2020. That wasn't the first time a mask showed up in the house of God. Come on, some of you know how to smile. You just got to fight with your spouse in the car right before you pulled up. You already yelled at the kids, but he come and said, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And there's so many things we go through and we've learned how to compartmentalize and put on masks. But as we're doing that on the inside, we've disqualified ourselves because said, I know me. I know my issues, I know my shortcomings, I know my mistakes. There's no way God can use me. I know he wants a holy vessel, but I've done so many unholy things. I know he wants me to live a certain way, but I ain't got there yet, not anywhere close. So of course God can use super spiritual person and super saint, but he can't use me. That is untrue. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and calling of God without repentance, he's not taking it back, he's not withdrawing it. But you need to open your eyes and you need to see the invite once again. You have to understand the call is still there. Say the call is still there. Those of you online, put it in the chat. Let's say it again, say the call is still there. The call is still there. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. The gift is still there. The call is still there. Think about Moses. Remember, we can look at the Old Testament for inspiration and comfort. We can grow in our endurance. That there was a call on his life to be a deliverer. He was trained. Think about this. If you're going to be trained to how to lead a nation... The leadership of Egypt is probably a good place to learn how to do it. You know how he gave his excuse, well, I can't talk. Yeah, right, Moses. You were trained by the best of the best of the best in the world. Pharaoh is your grandpa. Whatever you want, it is yours, bro. He was trained in what was the advanced things of the day. He began to understand his call. He knew who he was. Because when he saw one of his own people being abused, something rose up in him and said, I got to do something. Now, he acted on his call in the wrong way and messed it up. And they like, ooh, everybody knows what I did. Let me run to the backside of the desert. Because you got to think, if he's living on the backside of the desert, he's not really planning to come back to Egypt. He's adjusted to his life. He's adjusted to being a shepherd. 
But all of a sudden, while he's out there with his flock, he sees something. A bush that will not be consumed. Something caught his attention. See, God knows what gets your attention. He knew what needed to happen to snap Moses out of it. And so he gets closer and closer and closer, and God tells him, I am that I am. Take off your shoes where you're standing is holy ground. And God calls him. Moses gives all these excuses, and God says, I ain't taking one of them. Who made your mouth? And he says, well, I need help. Your brother's already on his way. Next. Moses, by this point, is 80. Yet the call was still there. Say, the call is still there. Say, the gift is still there. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Notice what Paul tells Timothy. Neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give yourself wholly to them that your prophecy may appear to all. Take heed unto yourself unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you shall both save yourself and them that hear you. The word neglect means to make light of to be careless of, to be negligent of. The word neglect here means to make light of, to be careless of, to be negligent of. Paul, spiritual father, talked to his spiritual son, Timothy. Don't neglect that gift, dude. Don't make light of it. See, there's something within Timothy that the gift got placed in him he was making light of for whatever reason. He was maybe, because one of the things we know, Paul talked to him about, hey, you're young, but don't let anyone look, on, look down on you because you're young. Timothy went on to pastor the largest church of the ancient world. A church that was operating so strongly, Jesus said, would be, he corrected them on some things, but he says, I know your works. Y'all doing it. I know your patience. I know y'all have tried false apostles and said y'all false. This is the leading church of the day that he goes on to lead. But he didn't lead it that way or get to the furthest point, even near the end of the first century, without this encouragement from Paul, don't neglect the gift. Don't make light of the gift. Don't be careless of the gift. Don't be negligent with the gift. There's a gift. Say, there's a gift. Each one of us have been given a gift, at least one. Sometimes multiple and several, there's a gift on the inside of you. Have you neglected it? Have you been careless with it? Have you made light of it? You see, some of us, through trying to be humble and religious, will make light of the gift God has given us because we don't know how to receive praise. Because we've been told if we receive praise, oh no, you've touched God's glory. Or if someone gives you a compliment, no, 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 I'm a horrible worm, you know. That's not Bible. Here's what I learned to do. When God does something wonderful in our experience, or says something wonderful, and it does it through me, I said, it's a gift. Why? Because if I say it's a gift, I didn't create the gift. I'm just a recipient. There was a giver, I just received it. So you saying it's a gift doesn't rob God of his glory. It's pointing, it's a gift. I'm not saying how long I worked on it, how long I prayed, how long it took me to write my message, how long I studied, how long I went to school. I'm not saying any of that. It's a gift. Why? Because there's a giver. And the giver gets all the glory. Neglect not the gift that is in you. Don't make light of it. Don't be careless. That means you're going to have to take care of it. And the next verse tells you one of the ways to take care of that gift. It says, meditate on all these things. So everything Paul told him, he said to meditate on, including not neglecting the gift. The word meditate means to attend carefully. Attend to carefully. It also means to imagine. It also means to practice. So think about LeBron James. 
whether you cheer for him or not, because he's fun to cheer against because he's that good. But imagine how much he practices. He already had a gift. We saw that from his teenage years. But he didn't neglect the gift. He practiced. He put it to use. Someone like Steph Curry, that's a gift. I can't do that. You can't either. Don't even act like you can. They'll say, well, back in my day, I was good at Steph. No, you weren't. <laughs> that's a gift. But he practiced. This summer, we were watching the Olympics and our U.S. gymnasts and my daughters and I were watching. That's gifts. Every single one of them, giftings. It's like, I can't fly in the air like that. I don't even want to get on the bar. You jump off the bar. It's a gift. And they practice and practice and practice that gift. Are you practicing your gift? Or are you neglecting your gift? And I'll use an example because it's fun to do. Minister Dathan is very gifted, super gifted. He's been practicing since what, two? In the womb, in the womb. He's been practicing and developing his gift his entire life. Are you neglecting your gift? Then this word also means imagine. Are you imagining yourself using your gift? One of the things the Lord began to have me do as a teenager, imagine myself doing the miracles of God. I would imagine myself praying for the sick. I would imagine myself flowing in the Spirit. I would imagine myself preaching in places. I would see it again and again and again. And as I would do it, the Lord said, he would show me other examples as you can do it too. He was putting an image on the inside of me so that when it was time for me to do what he called me to do, I had already seen myself do it. See, we like to see things before we do it. What if God calls you to do something that's never, done no, it's never been done before? Well, how do I see it? See an example. Imagine. Come on, it can't just be Walt Disney and George Lucas who have great imaginations. You got to have a great imagination too. Imagine yourself doing what God called you to do. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Second Timothy chapter one, verse six. Say, there's a gift. Say, there's a call. Say, it's still there. Second Timothy. Chapter one, Paul's next letter to this young man of God. It says, wherefore I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God, which is in you by the putting on of my hands. He's talking to Timothy about that gift once again. First he said, don't neglect it. Now it says, stir it up. The Amplified Classic Edition says it this way. This is why I will remind you to stir up, rekindle the embers of, fan the flame of, and keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire that is in you by the means of the laying on of my hands with those of the elders at your ordination. So that gift that went in you, because God will at times impart greater gifts to you through the laying on of hands, through impartation. It's something I believe greatly in. I remember, especially as I started out younger in ministry, when I was doing some itinerant ministry, before I would go out to, to preach, when I was praying, I would begin to imagine all the men and women of God, my elders who laid hands on me. I would begin to think about it. I thought about Bishop and Pastor Deborah. I would think about Rick Renner, Marilyn Hickey, the Copelands, Benny Hinn. I would think about my time with Kenneth Hagan and Oral Roberts, Tim Story, Claudio Frazo. I began to look at all these different people in my mind, and I began to imagine them surrounding me, praying over me. And then I would say, every gift that's been imparted to me I stir up now for whatever needs to happen in this service. Let it flow. What I began to imagine what God already put on the inside. 
And so when I would step up to the pulpit, so whatever God wants to flow is going to flow because it's stirred up on the inside. It's not about me, the recipient. It's about the giver who gave the gift. And I choose to be a good steward of the gifts he's given. Stir it up. Because think about it this way. Got my pastoral mug here. Got some hot water in here. And I got some apple cider. Now, how many know it's not apple cider yet? But you know, if I put the apple cider in here and just left it, it's still not apple cider yet. It's not my apple cider until I... Or think about this. Anybody used to drink quick as a kid? I like the strawberry quick. So whether you use the powder or the syrup, and some of you might have been more, you know, it's like, we'll just do a little bit. Oh, some of you might have been like me. Let's, you know, abundance, let's put it in. And you could stir it up in that milk and drink it. It tastes good. But what happens if you left it on the table for a while? It would settle on the bottom. So what did you need to do again? Stir it up. It says to rekindle, fan the flame of. If you've ever had a fireplace or you went camping and had a fire, the fire is good for a while, but eventually you have to get a stick and maybe poke a log a little bit. Why? It's stirring it up again. See, that's what the Spirit of God's doing. He's poking. It's like that old Facebook poke. 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 What are you trying to do? He's trying to stir you up. Remember what I called you to do. Remember what gift I put on the inside of you. Some of you have been sitting on that table and you thought the milk had spoiled, but God said, I preserved the milk. I just need you to stir yourself up a little bit. See, God will send messages and experiences like this to stir us up, but it's primarily our responsibility to keep ourselves stirred up on a regular basis. Because Paul even added, stir it up and keep it burning. Because God wants us here for the long haul. One of the things Bishop would talk to me as he was training me, he says, I don't want you to be a flash in the pan. I need you here for the long haul. I don't need you just do one big thing, you exploded, and then you gone. You have to be here for the long haul. So I pause to stir it up and keep it burning. See, if we fail to stir ourselves up and stir our gifts up for a long period of time, we'll eventually neglect the gift that God's put on the inside of us. Go with me as we begin to close to Luke 19. Luke 19. Don't neglect the gift. Say, don't neglect the gift. Luke 19, verse 11. See, in Luke 19 and in Matthew, Jesus tells two different parables. These are two different ones, but they have similar messages. And so we're going to look at them together so we can drive home what we're sharing today. Luke 19, verse 11, and as they heard these things, Jesus added and spake a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and because they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. So he's talking about, I'm going away. They didn't get it yet. He says, but I'm going away. It's going to be a while but then I'm going to come back. Here's what I expect you to do while I'm gone. Occupy. Go ahead, put that in the chat. Let's say it out loud together. Occupy. So we talked about last week how the first advent is full of hope. And as we get closer to the second advent of Jesus, we're to be people of hope. It's even called the blessed hope. These bookends of this age are filled with hope. And we are to be hopeful, not hopeless. You know, there's some people when they talk about the end times, like, oh, it's going to get dark in the world. Guess what? Sinners are going to sin. That's what they do. Sinners sin. Oh, there's an antichrist. Yeah, there's an antichrist. Yep, yep, he's in there. There's a false prophet too. 
There's a lot of evil people in the world. But why focus on them? Because we become so consumed. I like, well, someone taught me, one of my mentors, Hilton Sutton, he prayed over me and taught me to me a lot about the end times. And he laid hands on me. He's one of the people who laid hands on me. And he would say, someone told him one time, well, I can almost hear the hoofbeats of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And Hilton suddenly kind of looked at him like, I'm not listening for that. I'm listening for the trumpet. See, what are you focused on? Because, you know, last year, I don't know how many times I tell people, look, the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. No, 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 it's not. No, 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 no. Wearing a mask and not the mark of beast. Pastor, don't you think if you... <laughs> We're focused more on those things than Jesus. I still remember last year, a couple months before the election, I was praying about the election and praying about the turnout. Whatever God wanted to do is praying over the different things, praying for both sides. And as I was walking and praying, I heard my spirit. It says, the election is not even the biggest thing going on in the spirit world right now. I'm like, er? well, let me reshift how I think about things. Because for us as Americans and for a lot of people in the world, we thought the biggest thing last year was the election. But God doesn't see things the way we see them. And if your view of living at the end time is that everything is dark, everything is horrible, well, the world is dark, Pastor. Yes, but the church is light. It's despair in the world, but there's hope in the church. What are you focusing on? Those who are without God or you who's with God? Yes, the end time has some rough stuff. But those who walk with God, those who walk by faith, those who walk in love, everything shall be all right. The main character of even the tribulation is not the Antichrist, nor the false prophet. They are losers. They lose at every turn. The main person of these end times is Jesus of Nazareth, the risen Savior, the soon coming King, the Christ of God, the Lamb of God who was sent to take away the sins of the world, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the main character. He needs to be our focus, not all the drama of the end times. He is our hope. He is the foundation of our hope. We approach the end times with boldness because we know Jesus. We know who he is. We know his promises. We know he's coming back again. We know he hasn't left us without a comfort. He left us the Holy Ghost. So we address all the drama of the end times from a standpoint of hope, a standpoint of faith, a standpoint of love, because we know our God. And we can look at the Old Testament how time and time and time and time again he delivered his people, no matter what Pharaoh did, no matter what Nebuchadnezzar did, no matter what anyone did, God time and time and time and time again delivered his people. So no matter what shows up in 2021 or 2022, God did it before, he can do it again. So we have to be people of hope. We have to choose to look at the word more than we look at the news. Choose to look at the word more than look at social media. Choose to look at the more, word more than listen to everybody calling you about something bad that happened. Every new hashtag. What is God saying to you? Occupy till I come. Another translation is do business until I come back. God wants you to handle business until he comes back. Too many Christians ran to their prayer closet and never came back out. Yes, pray, but do something. Think about this. What will please Jesus more? 
when he comes back, seeing us hiding in our prayer closet, praying and trying to stay holy, or out there doing what he called us to do. Too many people look at the return of the Lord like a black ops mission. That Jesus is going to sneak into the earth like SEAL Team 6. Get us and leave. No, he's coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. A triumphant church. A church that's keeping darkness under its feet. That's who we're supposed to be right now. Not those who are running and hiding. This is not the weak days and the end days of the church. This is our finest hour. I don't care who deconstructs word. This is our finest hour. Matthew 25, verse 14. Other twin parable to this. Occupy till I come. Do business till I come. Jesus said, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Before he left, he passed out stuff. Every single servant of the Lord, anybody serve Jesus? You've received some goods. And this example is called talents. That's for a large amount of money. In Luke 19, that's for a smaller amount of money. So whether you consider your talent or your gifting huge, a big gift, or a small gift, Jesus got you covered. And he's saying the same thing to you. Occupy till I come back. Do business till I come back. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. Look, it's not fair. Look, stop whining about what's fair or not and use what God has given you. You know, we were telling one of our daughters this week, says, life is not fair, but God is just. Too many people are whining about what's not fair and not using what God has given them. Well, they have more privilege than I do. They might, but you got the advantage. Because the scripture says, those who are new creations in Christ Jesus have the advantage. And it says, faith works by love gives you the advantage. So even if you're in a situation and somebody has more privilege, you still got the advantage. So stop whining about privilege and use your advantage. We complain about way too much. I still remember something Bill Winston said years ago before he bought the mall that where their church is and they opened up a fresh food market to feed the neighborhood, all this other wonderful stuff they're doing up there. And so he was going through the process of purchasing that. And someone came to him, they meant well, and they said, well, sir, you know, uh, <laughs> they don't want a black man to have that. And he looked at him and said, aunt, I'm the seed of Abraham. And he got it. So you have to be careful what you listen to. Because people will tell you you are limited by a whole bunch of different reasons. Limited because of your age, your education, your background, your race, your gender, who you know, who you don't know. They'll tell you all these different reasons why you are limited and you can't get ahead. And why you have to rely on some other system to get ahead in this life. And if you keep listening to them, you will look down on what God made you to be. You will look down on who God made you to be. But when you begin to understand what has already been accomplished through the finished work of Jesus and how it doesn't matter what the world has set up, you have the advantage. Well, what about systemic racism? Sure, it's there. It's a Babylonian system. There's racism in Babylon. But aren't you more than a conqueror through him that loves you? So yes, you may run up into a system that's infested with devils. Beat it. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Doesn't matter what you face, you're on the winning side. 
So we need to stop letting people tell us how to see ourselves. They don't get to make that decision. They don't get to label us. Because if you allow them to label you, you allow them to limit you. You need to believe what Jesus said about you. If he said it, that's who you are. Doesn't matter what everyone else said. You too old, that's not what Jesus said. You too young, that's not what Jesus said. You too this, that is not what Jesus said. I choose to believe what Jesus said. Well, Pastor, what about all the wrongs that are in the world? I'm not ignoring the wrongs. I'm telling you to go address them. Engage every giant. Well, I don't like what they pay women out there. Well, prosper, grow your business, hire somebody and pay them right. Change it. We, the church, are the hope centers of the world. If we don't like what we see in the world, then we must change it. If we don't like the darkness we see, we need to shine brighter. We have to stop looking at the government as the source to fix everything in this nation. They broke. Why? It doesn't matter what side of the aisle. People are like, well, you know, this election, how dare we think an election is the answer? That an election will save America. How many times have we said that and how many elections do we have? And we're like, well, still here, still got all the same old issues. It's time for the church to be the church. And rise up and do what God has called us to do. For the sake of time, I'll skip down to the end in this parable. The person who had five got five more. And Jesus said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. The one who had two got two more. He said the same thing. But the one who had one came back and said, well, I knew you were a tough boss. You harvest where you haven't sown. So I just hid my gift, what you gave me, in the earth. Now I dusted it off. Here it's back. And in Luke 19, the Lord replies, out of your own mouth, I will judge you. Or I will judge you by the words of your own mouth. You said I was a tough boss. You said I reap where I don't sow. If you believed all that, why didn't you at least take my money, put it in the bank so I got some interest off of it and give that to me? He said, you wicked, that means twisted, and lazy servant. Too many people have taken what God has given them and just hid it in the dirt. They're neglecting it. For whatever reason, your reason could be because you went into despair. Or your reason is you just don't want to do what God called you to do. Whatever the reason is, that's not where you're supposed to be. As a servant of God. As a child of the Most High God. We'll look into is maybe next week or sometime later on how there are those who will say well look Jesus is delaying his coming I'm gonna drink I'm gonna party and it says they begin to mistreat their fellow brothers and sisters Matthew chapter 24 read it Jesus lays it all out and it says Jesus will come back suddenly they won't even realize he's about to come back and he will judge them for it and in the next chapter he tells this story of people who've taken their gifting and have hidden it in the dirt. Where is your gift today? Are you out doing business? Are you out occupying? Are you taking what God has given you and multiplying? Or do you need to go dig up something today? See, it's better to dig it up now than when he comes back. You hear a trumpet call, it's like, ooh, hold on. I got it. I... Kind of late then. Don't neglect your gift. Don't delay answering his call. There's work for you to do. Why? Jesus is coming soon. So we must do what he's called us to do. 
whether soon as seven years from now or 70, every second we draw breath, it's getting quicker and sooner. And in the meantime, we need to do what he tells us to do. We are to be people of hope. We are to be people of faith. But we have to be people who are about our Father's business. Using every gift he's put on the inside of us. God is the greatest businessman who ever existed. He wants a return on every investment. And he's invested in you. Gifts, callings, anointings, graces on the inside of you right now. See, there's more on the inside of you than you've ever given God credit for. Because you have to understand your spirit, for here's an example I like to use, how I see it in my mind. You know, growing up as a millennial, he uses different things to point out scriptural truths. Anybody remember DuckTales? Remember how Uncle Scrooge had that ability to dive into that money bin and swim around and pop back out, spit out the coins and everything? Remember that? Your spirit is like the money bin. God has put stuff in there that you haven't even realized have been put in. You're thinking about one gift right now, but if you begin to use that one, God will show you the rest. See, we're getting into the, remember how we've had certain experiences where it seems like the Holy Ghost just went wild. We just have stories like, man, like, it took them 30 minutes to get off the carpet. Did you see how they fell out? Man, did you see that? Wow, did you see that? And we have these times. But you know what happens during those times? God puts things in your heart. He drops things in your spirit. He drops embers in your heart. That all it takes is a fresh move of the Spirit of God to ignite it to a fire. Or you to stir it up. Or if you want to use another example, Jurassic Park, those ambers. There's ambers on the inside of you. Things that as you begin to engage, it becomes alive again. Things you thought were fossils and dead and gone. No, the gift is still there. The gift is still relevant. It is your time to do what God has called you to do. See, at the top of the year, we're going to do our vision series because God has called us to do something. There is a vision, and it's quickly coming to pass. But it's not just me and campus directors and the prayer team. It's all of us doing what God has called us to do, bringing the supply of the Spirit God has granted us. As it tells us in Ephesians, Philippians, we all have a supply. And when the supplies come together, the body of Christ grows and increases in love. Every one of us has something to offer. You are here for such a time as this. Old Testament gives us comfort and endurance, right? Think about Esther. Young teenage girl. It's an orphan. Grew up in her uncle's household. She grows up, and now she's the queen of an empire. Life has turned out pretty good. Think about it. You're the queen. And the king don't even bother you every day. You can live your whole life and just enjoy it. Nobody's going to tell you no to anything. You're the queen. But then a plot arises to destroy God's people. And Esther was nervous about stepping up and doing what she knew would be right. But her uncle said, who knows if for such a time as this, you are brought to the kingdom. And then he added this warning. He says, if you don't stand up, destruction will fall on you and your house. But God will deliver his people another way. And Esther replied, all right, get it right together. Let's pray and fast for a couple days. We got this. And God delivered his people. But who knew that's why he made Esther queen? for such a time as this. The place where you're at, the school you work in, the business you work in, for such a time as this. The neighborhood you live in for such a time as this. Your favorite coffee place to frequent for such a time as this. He's like, well, how is that important? God may have you like coffee just so you can be there one day, minister, deliver somebody, get your venti and walk out the door. See, God is smarter than any of us. And he has a wonderful design. 
He has giftings on the inside of you. Don't neglect them. Stir them up. Do what God has called you to do. And let yourself off the hook. Because some of you is like, oh, I just feel too bad. I've done too much. You're like Peter saying, I go a fishing. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's like, I'm going fishing. Why? He denied Jesus. Peter, the one who had the mouth. The one who said, now nah, Jesus, doesn't matter what happens, I'm not going to deny you. And Jesus said, before, curls three times, you're going to do it. No, nah, it can't be me. You're wrong about it, Jesus. He did it. And then when he read the Gospels, it says, after it happened, Jesus looked at him across the courtyard. And Peter ran out of the courtyard crying. The only one who stayed close the whole time was John, out of the 12 apostles, as well as some of the women and some of Jesus' family members. They stayed close. Outside of that, Peter was gone. And so when Jesus raised from the dead, he said, I'm going fishing. And people's like, well, we're going with you. <laughs> but do you know what happened? He couldn't catch anything all night long again. And in the morning, Jesus right there on the beach. Did you catch anything? You hungry? Look kind of hangry. I got some food for you. And John says, it's the Lord. And as soon as Peter heard that, he ran. He got jumped in the water, got dressed, swam to Jesus. But notice Jesus knew what needed to be done to get Peter's attention. He went to where Peter was. He said, I got breakfast. And then he asked him three different times in different ways, do you love me? What is he doing? He's restoring him. See, some of you in here need to let yourself off the hook. And you're staring at me because God got your attention today. Whether you're in this room or online, God's got your attention. Let yourself off the hook. Ask God for forgiveness, then forgive yourself. And stir up the gift God's put on the inside of you. Stand to your feet. Glory to the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So lift your hands to him. And if you need to make some corrections in your heart, go ahead and do so. If you need to ask for forgiveness for neglecting the gift, go ahead and do so. If you need to repent of some things, go ahead and do so. In a few moments, I'm going to have Pastor Kurt do the actual altar call, but some of you need to make that shift in your heart right now. Make that shift. The gift is still relevant. The gift is still there. The calling is still extended. For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Bring God your finest gifts this Christmas. Bring him the gifts he's put on the inside of you. Stirred up. Rekindled. Put into practice. Hallelujah. And may the wind of the Spirit refresh you. Aid you in rekindling the flame. Bring you renewal and usher you into a place of rest.